Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Today's the Day Changemakers podcast. I am Jody Grunwald. This week, my guest is Vincent Myers, president and co-founding member of DI Group Architecture, an award-winning minority-owned architectural firm headquartered in New Brunswick, New Jersey. DI Group specializes in architecture, planning, interior design, environmental graphics, signage, and wayfinding services for senior living, education, healthcare, and civic clients. Vince and I talk about how his dad, Harvey, truly inspired him to go into architecture. Harvey served as a role model for Vince and was one of the first African-American licensed architects in New Jersey. Due to Vince's tremendous passion for the work he does, he enjoys mentoring students who are interested in a career in architecture. Vince also shares as a guest speaker on the future of aging, sharing insights with leading developers and operators of senior living communities. Vince shares with me how the pandemic affected the architecture industry and how DI Group pivoted to help their clients in other ways. We talk about what it's like seeing a project go from the planning stages to completion and the feeling of seeing people utilize that space. Think of the space you are in right now as you listen to this. Someone had a vision, worked with an architect, and brought it to life. Take a listen to the end of the podcast, where Vince answers the question, what is the footprint you are creating now that you want to leave behind? Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Today's the Day Changemakers YouTube channel, stream this podcast on all streaming sites, comment, like, and share, and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Today is the Day Live It. The views expressed by all Today's the Day Changemakers podcast guests are their own. Their appearance on the Today's the Day Changemakers podcast does not imply any endorsement of them or any entity that they represent. Have a great week, everyone. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Today's the Day Changemakers podcast. I am Jody Grinwald, and every week I tell you that I interview the most incredible people that are making a difference in their corner of the world and beyond. And today I have Vince Myers with me. Hi, Vince. How are you? Jody, how are you? Thank you very much. Good. I'm so glad to have you here. I'm so excited for our conversation because I was reading uh, your bio a little bit before, um, of course, the podcast, and you're doing such incredible things. So congratulations to you. And I'm going to read a little bit for everybody now, and then we'll get into a conversation. Sound good? Sure. It sounds great. Awesome. So Vincent Myers is president and co-founding member of VI Group Architecture, an award-winning minority-owned architectural firm headquartered in New Brunswick, New Jersey. He has helped grow the firm to include a rich, diverse portfolio of projects for senior living nationally and healthcare, civic, and education clients locally throughout New Jersey, New York, and greater Philadelphia area. He is a recognized leader in educating clients and designing spaces to fit the complex needs of the new aging generation from independent living residents to those requiring skilled nursing and memory care services. Recently, his efforts have focused on preparing for the design of the next generation of senior facilities within urban areas. Vince serves as a guest speaker on the future of aging, sharing insights with leading developers and operators of senior living communities. DI Group Architecture is one of the area's largest minority black owned firms certified as a minority owned, disadvantaged owned and small business enterprise, specializing in architecture, planning, interior design and environmental graphics, signage, and wayfinding services for senior living, education, healthcare, and civic clients. Wow. (laughs) How'd I do that? That's a lot, right? (laughs) (laughs) And there was more. There was so much more I could have, I I, I could have gone on because there's awards and and so many wonderful things that you're doing. So we'll talk to everybody and let everybody know where they can find all of that great information as we move through the conversation today. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so Vince, what I like to do with all of my guests is go back and learn a little bit more about the person before we get to the organization. And I would love to learn about where you grew up. I mean, where this all began, all this entrepreneurial spirit and all the great work you're doing. Who's Vince as a child? All right. So I was born in Newark, New Jersey, and uh, I have um, a brother, a sister, uh, but at the time I was four years old, we we moved out of Newark. Uh, at the time, I had an older brother who was seven years old, um, and so I, I was fortunate. Um, you know, we lived on Peshine, Peshine Avenue in Newark, and it was one of the areas uh, ultimately in this in the mid to late sixties that were um, hit by riots um, after the assassination of Martin Luther King, um, and uh, that was one of the times I went back there. My parents took me back to Newark um, into our neighborhood. Um, and it was just uh, destroyed. And uh, but um, from from the from the perspective of um, who I became, um, I owe a lot of that to my father. 
Uh, my father is an architect. And uh, I recently wrote a story in uh, for the AIA, um, New Jersey uh, chapter. And I talked a little bit about my first influences with, uh, you know, with uh, architecture through him. Uh, he was one of the first African-American architects and a licensed architects in the state of New Jersey um, without a formal education um, who loved architecture. And so from very early age, uh, I was introduced um, to, uh, to architecture through him. That, that's that's amazing, and it's it's in some cases we follow in our parents' footsteps, right? Because we see them as incredible role model, models. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. It, and and others we don't, but we always take messages with them. Is there something that your father does? Is there a mantra or something that he's always said to you that stands out to you? Ah, uh, that's a you know that's a real great question. Um, there are so many things. Um, uh, my father was the kind of guy that. Um, he just did what he did so um, with so much class um, and so much energy and so much love and never and never focused on anything that was negative. I, I, the, the funniest thing he ever told me and I wrote about it in the story was, you know, he said, look, when you know, when I started architecture way back when my first job, I, he wanted to go be a draftsman and he, he joked that they wanted um, they wanted him to pay them for the job. And, um, and so he was such a, you know, I always took it as a joke. I could never, um, you know, in the life that, I, that I've had ever understand how somebody could, could do that or say that. Um, but again, understanding that it truly was, um, and still is to a certain degree, a white man's profession. And um, there weren't many uh, people of color um, interested in architecture, not nearly like he was. Um, and, you know, and there was a guy who was never upset um, by all the hurdles that he had to overcome, not only to be an architect, but to open up his own business, a very successful business in Princeton, New Jersey, of all places, in the early 70s. And so it's really, a, I, you know, he's the guy that, that really is a change maker in my mind. I, I just feel like many times I'm, um, I'm, you know, I'm surfing in his wake, so to speak, but um, you know, but uh, he he just was, uh, you know, a brilliant guy that did his thing. Um, and, and, and so much of, you know, to your question about certain mantras that he said, he, he just led by example. Um, and and it's, the, it's kind of the way that I've grown up is, you know, just doing, working really hard um, at what I love doing. And I'm just so very fortunate to be an architect. Um, it's a fantastic profession. It's given me um, you know, I, I'm just inspired every day, not only about the projects that I have, but the people that I work with every day. So um, I just can't be more uh, blessed uh, in that regard. I can tell you we have something in common, not architecture. I wish that was definitely not, unfortunately, not my forte, but I give so much credit to those who are able to make it ha all happen. Uh, we're grateful to you for that. Oh, but thank you. But I definitely understand that looking up to your dad, you know, I had that same thing and that whole power of positivity and setting that that right example. And that just it really is a sticks with you and helps you motivate, stay motivated. But the other thing is, Vince, that I just want to add to that is that then you take that legacy and you That's right. to the next with the next generation. And then you are the change maker with the influence from those before us. And I think that's what's so great is that you recognize that not everybody recognizes. Yes, I try to plug in um, and um, we again lead by example. Um, I've also learned that um, you know I also needed to do certain things proactively, um, and uh, certainly in the position that I am, um, I can do that. But I've always been uh, uh, very much focused on helping people. Um, I've always been, um, and and again, my father. I uh, was very much like that. And that's where I, I learned how to, how to give back. He was always very much, um, you know, giving back to the, you know, to the community, always involved in organizations. He was a, he was a Boy Scout leader. Ultimately, when, even when I was in high school, I was involved in uh, nonprofit organizations. I still am. I'm on the Borden Foundation um, here in New Jersey. Um, and I, I, you know, was vice president of the ACE program, which is architecture, construction, engineering. Uh, helping inner city youth learn about architecture. Um, and, you know, those are probably my, some of my proudest moments, to be quite honest, is just, uh, you know, having the opportunity to engage with people. Uh, and, you know, and some of them, it's just amazing that 
um, you know, that they're so appreciative. And, you know, they still, you know, some of my students from the ACE program in East Orange, where I headed up a chapter there, um, you know, still reach out to me and, uh, you know, and just thank me. And, and, I'm, and in my mind, I, I say, I didn't do anything, but, uh, you know, but they are so appreciative of it. And, uh, and I'm, I'm thankful to have them as part of my family for sure. I'd like to talk a little about I and mean, go back to what you said before, because I think it's really important for the audience to hear uh, a little bit about those obstacles. You know, you talked about the obstacles about all that your father had to do in order to start a business in Princeton. And as you said, it's a dominated white profession, um, has been for years. And it's it's talk to us. Is that still a struggle today? And and what it took to get you to where you are today as well. Did you feel those obstacles as you were moving up and going to school and then getting into the business world? You know, it was interesting because I I um, when I mentioned to you that we moved out of Newark, we moved into um, basically English Town, New Jersey. Um, if you a lot of people know where that is um, for uh, a couple of reasons, you know and. Um, you know, and it's all good, but that's where I lived, um, English Town, New Jersey. And uh, so it was, that was also a very, it was a very white dominant community. Um, yes. we, my, my, um, my father was fortunate enough to have um, worked really hard and kind of put us in a position where we could um, live that kind of lifestyle, um, basically a middle-class American lifestyle. And, um, and so I, I, I never really understood. I knew a lot. I read a lot. I understood what we were going through as a country. Um, once I, um, you know, certainly was going through, you know, middle school, high school. Um, I saw things. I started to learn about things that I didn't like. Um, and but what was ingrained in me was just do your thing and you know um, just keep working hard and move yourself forward and. Um, even when I got to college um, at Syracuse University, again, the program was dominated um, uh, from that perspective as well um, by the majority. And, but, you know, I, I started to make, you know, connections to um, other African-Americans who were in the program. There weren't many of us and uh, really enjoyed that kind of camaraderie and that kind of connection. Some of them are still my friends today. Um, uh, and have done uh, really well for themselves. And it's, it's wonderful, you know, to see. And so I, um, when we, I got out of uh, college, graduated, and I was working for my father and we were running, uh, my father's company at its peak was about 30 people. And then we started another company uh, in Princeton and it was really kind of cool. And we were working together and then again, I just I, I just love the fact that, you know, when you're working with somebody that, you know, just really kind of cares about, you know, everybody cares about what they do. And we were a struggling small business, you know, and and it didn't you know, it didn't I don't know that it ever really minded to me. I, I just thought that, hey, I'm just doing what I really like to do with, you know, with my father um, and other people within the firm. And, and the successes that we had were successes. And I knew that sometimes the losses were in large part due to the fact that people were uncomfortable working with um, a minority firm. And, and so it actually frustrated me in some respects more than it frustrated him. I don't know how that is, to, you know, how that came about, but I, I sort of started, we, we started thinking about always different ways to propel the firm. And, 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 th and that led ultimately to, you know, the opportunity uh, that ultimately uh, became the firm where we are today, where I am today. And that is, you know, how um, several firms uh, uh, decided to work together um, because of the Abbott funding bill that came out roughly in 2000. Um, and that was the real pivot point um, because that was the real opening that um, not only I saw, my father saw, and other firms that uh, we were aligned with at the time, I uh, saw a great opportunity to kind of band together um, and create another, um, you know, kind of create another firm um, that was uh, uh, larger, um, took advantage of our skill sets, um, and and that's a really fantastic story of how those firms came together. And then that ultimately became DI Group Architecture. 
How many different firms were there that came together? There were five firms and, uh, and there, uh, we worked together from, I would say 2000 um, to 2006. And so we each had our own individual firms and the, we started a sixth firm, right? So the sixth firm was called NJK 12 Architects uh, because we're going after school related work. Right. And, and the idea was, is that we each had really unique, um, you know, we had a, a, a unique skill set in that we were connected um, to many of the communities uh, that were Abbott communities. And we were, art, we were, uh, we had educational experience, pretty significant educational experience. The problem was that um, what we were hearing on the grapevine and we had seen too often is that when large sums of money, uh, like you see uh, coming about in the infrastructure bill, um, when large sums of money come out, there are, everybody tries to get a hold of that money and they, and larger firms, you know, typically prevail. And the idea was that we would form an unlimited, com unlimited size company because there were different tiers. You were either, you know, you could, if you were unlimited, you could handle the largest projects. If you were a smaller company like ours, then you would only get the very smaller projects, even though we were very much, each of the firms that came in, we were connected to those communities and to those um, uh, boards of education. Um, and we didn't want to lose that. We didn't want to, we wanted to, be, we wanted to do work because we'd been there doing the work the whole time. And so we thought that um, this was our way to kind of protect our interests by banding together and then starting that other company. And so it was really brilliant. And we were so fortunate. I remember that to the day when my father and I were talking about it, we said, well, if we don't do something strategic, then all the work that we've been building over these years um, in these communities, it, we won't be able to take advantage of it. And as a result of banding together, and it was really fantastic. And you know, the, the state of New Jersey, uh, were, they were trying to figure out, well, how are you another company when you're part of another company? And we figured out a way to kind of um, let them know that um, you know, this was, uh, we had the experience for sure. And NJK 12 Architects, became the second largest provider of design services to the state through the Abbott program. And we still um, provide um, design services to the state at a very large level um, as DI group architecture, but our time with the state goes back, you know, uh, almost at this point, 20 years. That's incredible. What a great story. What a, what a growth story and, and truly, truly wonderful. Um, you know, you talked about in the opening when I was reading your bio, the new aging uh, generation. I feel like when I say that, I feel like that might include me as well. Like we're all we're all aging, right? We're all we're all aging. Yeah, <laughs> we're all aging. How are our our needs as you're at, in this in the structures you're building in in the things that you're looking at doing for this new aging community? What's different compared to generations before us? Well, if we're talking specifically about. Um, senior living, which is, um, you know, a passion of mine um, within the firm that, uh, uh, and I've been around the, the, um, the industry, the market for a very long time. And in the past, it was all geared toward um, a, a very much a very prescribed uh, kind of approach, meaning that, you know, you, by the time you were in your early 60s, if you were if you had the if you had the financial uh, means, um, you would retire, um, and then you would go into one of these communities uh, and and uh, you know be taken care of and and uh, you know live your uh, live the the remainder of your life, right? And at that at that time, you know even if you go back forty years or so ago, hey, people weren't living nearly as long as they are now. Um, and, and something happened. I think um, it was a combination of people kind of ushered in by baby boomers, but certainly, you know, that desire to sort of say, well, wait a minute, um, you know, I'm in my 50s and 60s and, you know, or even later, and I'm still very much active. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to 
I don't want to throw in the towel quite yet. I want to continue to live. I want to continue to experience. If necessary, I want to continue to work. Um, and I don't necessarily like the idea of just being cocooned off somewhere, um, you know, with a with an a, a, you know with my peers in an Asian community, right? right. And and so people started thinking differently about that. I think that you know the the it's more about the the. The bricks and mortar, if you will, uh, remains uh, pretty consistent. But what it's what's changing in those communities is a um, the age uh, that people go into them now is on an average uh, eighty five, and uh, that's pretty astounding, right? Yeah, um, I'm sorry I had that reaction, but yes, eighty. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, and um, and you know, and the challenge for that industry is um, kind of making it feel less like you know, a place, um, your final resting place, if you will, and um, making it much more experience space, um, much more uh, invigorating, um, much more diverse, um, you know, in terms of culture and color. Um, and, you know, those are, that's why it's really dynamic. Those, those um, the models are changing to be, um, to have a much different focus now than they have had in the past. And again, it's primarily about you know um, creating opportunities for experience, which is you know largely driven um, by program, um, and the things that they do within the communities now are far more outreaching. Um, uh, there's movements, uh, there's uh, different kinds of programs that are uh, based on colleges and universities, um, so that they can kind of you know kind of reinvigorate their alumni. Get them connected to campuses um, so they can experience the you know the lifestyle of you know culture and art and sports and all those things, and so it's really been a, a, a very interesting um, you know trajectory as well as just um, you know the culture change that's involved in it and it's very much a, a now a person centered. Um, everybody is on you know if you're not on your game in terms of um, make taking care of people. Um, and, but that's true for any business these days because of the transparency involved, right? Uh, you, you really have to do a good job at taking care of your clients, taking care of people. And that is, you know, that is definitely an industry that has had horror stories associated with it. And they really want to make sure that, um, you know, nowadays you can really find if you have a loved one or, or if you want to go into one of those communities, it's really easy to get the data to find out, you know, who is really on top of their game. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. It, it's very interesting how, um, you know, not something that we all might think about, you know, until we're in that stage, but it's it's good to hear about, it is all about experience, right? I think we're very experiential and we want to, we want, we want to continue to go until, you know what I mean? And, and have that feeling of connection, but be active while we're doing it, you know? Sure, absolutely. Connection is also about activity, right? And that's right. That's right. Ham 10 is a leader in IT enterprise solutions and staffing. They are driven to transform their clients' business performances. They do this every day by providing the clients with the best services and products. Products like BizLego, an online community platform, and Colear, a unique learning management system. They also transform the lives of women and children through their associated nonprofits, SheTech which supports women in and joining the technology field, and Softkin, support organization for kids in need. PAM10, technology for social good. Go to pam10.com for more information. Now, now your business, I'm going to assume, and I, assumptions are never good, but um, pivoting is a word that um, I know got over, has been overused during the pandemic, but I would assume that your, your business had to pivot a little bit during the pandemic both with the work you're doing at schools and yes. hospitals. So I, I, can you share a little bit about how that had to, and I, I don't know, I like to use more for change or what, instead of the word pivot, I'm sure you're tired of that word too. Yeah, you know, it was, uh, I, you know, for, for most of us, I think when you, when you think about, uh, you know, what we're all, uh, what we went through and what we're still challenged mm -hmm. with, I, you know, certainly, uh, now as well, I, 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 in, our, in the businesses that, um, you know, that we serve, there's probably a, a little less focus on it now. And, and, and in some respects, relative to the bricks and mortar side of things, 
there we are getting somewhat back to normal with regard to that. So when we were going through it, I mean, it, the first thing is you're in shock because you don't, it's the first time anything like this has happened, you know, certainly to us. And, um, you know, we, we tended to think of, you know, economic impacts as opposed to, uh, which this did have an imp economic impact, but I mean, at its heart, it was a pandemic uh, that then became, you know, obviously uh, an impact uh, economically, um, really uh, hurt people, hurt businesses, um, uh, has has um, destroyed lives, um, uh, far too many to even count. And, um, and so from a business standpoint, we, uh, I'll, I'll say that depending on which market in healthcare, as an example, there, there was a real emphasis on, you know, just quickly, you know, real quickly, um, you know, uh, uh, changing rooms, changing wings, cha you know, um, switching this to a COVID unit, you know, they, there was no time to build anything. You just had to kind of adapt. So, um, you know, getting the right air changes um, within the patient rooms was, uh, was real important. Um, mechanical equipment, mechanical systems, proper air changes, all of those things were, were real key um, in the healthcare world. In, in senior living, because there was a ban on people going um, to, um, to those facilities, we, we actually put together a white paper that talked about creating um, an isolation room. Uh, that allowed for people to um, still come in and be connected with their loved ones with, without having to go through uh, the entire facility. And, and so we, you know, when we couldn't um, design, we wrote, um, and that was a case in point. You know, we kind of entered the fray that way. When in healthcare, it was about quickly responding to um, many of our clients' needs, which is to kind of move very quickly to address problems so that they could treat patients. In education facilities, it was primarily about how do, we, how do we structure, how do we have children come back to school and keep them safe? And then we would work with them in terms of, okay, how many children does that mean? We diagrammed ways for them to typically, you know, to use entry points, remote entry points. Normally when you think about schools, everybody was funneled through the front door. And, and for safety reasons and a whole host of things, but now you couldn't have three or 400 children rushing through the front doors to get into the school. And we had to kind of diagram out how, you know, uh, parents and teachers would then uh, get, get students, get children into the school through the, what were typically described that were typically from your point of view would be exit doors, right? They would use all those different entry points in the school to come into the building and then we're using and helping them um, kind of create um, not new space, um, but using the space that they had, which was you know larger you know art rooms, rooms that typically are not used simultaneously with classrooms, and so you could diffuse the population um, by you know um, helping them you know plan out where those spaces can be and laying out the furniture and showing them how that can all work. And then because we, as you pointed out, we provided uh, uh, way, we pr provide uh, wayfinding um, uh, expertise and skills as well. Um, and so we uh, provide, provided design signage and other things that, um, that was branded uh, to the, you know, to the colors of the school. Um, so that that was all an integrated approach for us. Um, we weren't doing large projects, um, but we were doing work uh, for our clients. And, you know, our legacy uh, is, is really, you know, built on um, repeat clients. So our clients helped pull us through the pandemic because they were calling upon us to help them um, in any way we could, not maybe in the traditional way, uh, that we would have done work, but in ways that they that we could help them um, survive the the pandemic, we banded together um, as professionals, and uh, and that's wonderful. Absolutely, it is, and that that I think is what helped to make so many companies stay in business was that they found where their niche. They had to, you know, kind of massage what they were pop, pop doing every day for years in some ways, 
and get very creative and, and almost a little bit change their niche for a little bit of time and then move back. Uh, you're seeing now, you know, are more projects starting up now for your organization? Absolutely. Um, all of our, uh, well, you know, I would say that that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting question because as the, uh, I talked about the pandemic having economic impacts, and one of them, you know, is, is, in, um, is in the area of supply chain. And I know you're feeling it, uh, maybe not in the same way we're feeling it, but uh, you, it's really difficult um, to get supplies. Um, and so what's, what's happened is that the cost of materials has really um, ratcheted up. And so in some cases, some of our clients are, are holding back um, and, and some of them are, were on the precipice of you know, starting construction, right? And, and now they're seeing uh, a real impact on uh, the cost of goods and materials and have said, we're gonna we're gonna wait for a few months for that to um, to for the dust to settle, so to speak. In other instances, um, many of our clients are moving full steam of ahead, and they're basically saying, "Hey, um, we just have to deal with it." So, how are they dealing with it? Well, they're they're getting into the construction stages, or in some cases, we're in design leading into construction, and part of the design process is helping, uh, working with them uh, to find individuals so they can start ordering material um, well in advance of when they need it. Uh, and it, it's, in some cases, it could be a year uh, before you might have roofing materials on the site, which, and so if they can afford it, they are doing it. Larger institutions are absolutely doing that. Um, and um, whether that's in higher ed, uh, or on the private side, private developers are doing it. They're really just saying, I can't wait. Um, I have to be proactive. And so fortunately, uh, we've started the year with uh, most of our clients moving their projects forward um, in New Jersey, New York, and Philadelphia and beyond. And so we're very fortunate uh, that we have a very, um, we have a very diverse uh, sort of market base. Um, you know, uh, like you pointed out, senior living, we have healthcare, um, higher education, um, we're doing civic work um, uh, in um, Union County, the Union County government complex. Um, we're working down at the Navy Yard in Philadelphia, working with um, bio, a biotech campus in Philadelphia. And so we're, um, we're fortunate uh, that we have a, a broad base not in terms of projects, but certainly geographically as well. No, it's it's, it's wonderful that you, that that's coming back. But you're right; it's it's incredible that you could be waiting for supplies for months on end, and and it's really stopping uh, things in their tracks. I mean, I I pass by things every day, saying, "Wow, it's been sitting there for such a long time. for such a long time." So I'm hope I hope to see because you want to get people working too, right? Because everybody's relying on. A salary in order to feed their family, and then if they don't have the materials, they can't do that. It, the ripple effect is is tremendous. I yeah, I you know that's the that's the one part. I I talked a little bit about um, not only my dedication, um, but our firm's dedication to uh, really to people. And for us, um, it is all about um, making those connections and really being aware of what is going on. And you know, I we I. I'm, I'm so fortunate. I, I, everything that I have, I'm, I'm just eternally grateful for. And, 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 and the people that I work with, I know that they, they too, um, you know, it matters to them, you know, what the work that we do and it, it, it doesn't necessarily put food in people's mouths or anything like that, but, but we do, we can, and, and we're dedicated to providing you know, outreach and doing those things. I, I pointed out um, my work on the Borden Foundation, um, and 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 you know that's not direct one on one, um, but um, I'm, mo I'm happiest when we go on our tours and we we connect with organizations, and you really see the dedication uh, that people have to helping other people, and and so everybody chooses um, their their profession or their career, um, but, it, but it's so important that through your career, 
you can impact people. And so when we talk to you know, our clients about who we are as architects, that I think, um, you know, when we've, you know, talked to them and, and we found out, you know, why, what was it about, about working with us? And they just said, you, you were just, you know, you were great people, it was a great experience. It was, you know, you cared about, you cared about us, you cared about what we we're doing, you cared about our mission, you cared about, you know, um, you know, when we opened the doors, you were there helping us, you know, you were doing things that, People, you know, it just seems people kind of get isolated from, but I think everybody can. And architecture is unique in the sense that we create space, you know, we create environments, you know, we create, you know, wonderful places where, you know, light comes in and people get excited about where they are. And, um, and even for that, you know, I, you know, it's amazing kind of tying this back to the work that we've done in educational facilities. You know, um, many of our clients, um, that we had way back when, when you know nobody had gone into a, a, a school in, you know, uh, in the urban areas of New Jersey for 50 years and done anything to try to fix those schools. They were they were literally falling down around students, and and it's really sad. And that's why the state got sued because um, you know this is supposed to be um, you know there's supposed to be parity, um, equality in, in education facilities and. And, and the amazing thing is, you know, there finally was money put on the table where there were finally new schools being developed um, and new technology um, in these schools. And I remember when we opened up the Cicely Cis uh, Tyson School for Performing Arts in East Orange and, and the talent and the love that those, you know, not only the, the students, but the, um, you know, but the staff and mm -hmm. the community you know, we're so excited about um, the, their new school and the opportunities they brought them. And you see, so that's where, you know, doing what we do matters, you know, when you see things like that. Um, we just finished a, um, uh, an early childhood center um, in Newark. Um, and I kind of started my story from that standpoint. Right. That, that is just, you know, fantastic. Um, and the stories about, you um, that are emerging from you know that beautiful project where there was another foundation that funded that, um, but it, it just opened its doors and it's it was just in a in a tough blighted area in Newark. But man, they got a school and you know um, you know it's just amazing the feedback that we received and that's what that's where we you know we realized it as a firm that that's those are the kind of projects that really um, make us feel real good and get us to work every day and get us excited about what we do. And, and then, you know, the passion that that brings out um, when you think about helping these communities, which is also what we're doing in Philadelphia through the rebuild program. And, you know, again, those projects are, are um, you know, emerged out of the soda tax um, and, um, and they're, they're rebuilding all of, um, as far as the money can take them, you know, the uh, community centers and the Carnegie libraries. And again, buildings that have been totally neglected for so long. And then, you know, we're, you know, uh, some of our, we have community meetings and, you know, we're, 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 we're there. I mean, it's fantastic. Just, you know, just getting excited about um, how excited they are and, and we just feed off of it. And again, that's the message that we, we like to deliver. Um, you know, that we are a firm that we're very talented. Uh, we are an MBE firm and we are dedicated to what we do. We're really good at it. And, uh, and we're just trying to push that message out there. You got me excited about all this stuff. The passion exudes from you, from the work. Oh, thank you. It really does. I mean, and that's, that's, I think what you said before is so important. You know, when you're doing your job, your career, it has to be something you love because you're spending so much time in that space that if you're not happy, then you can't have that feel, you know, I, you, you can tell either somebody like yourself who exudes that energy and you're on the ride, I'm listening to your story. And I can see as you're talking about people coming together, I can visualize that happening and people will be exciting, excited about what, what's now in their community. But if you don't have that same feeling, you can also fe feel that from someone else when they're talking about being unhappy in their role. So my question to you is there are people out there, you're a self-starter, right? You had that from your dad, but not everybody had that role model. 
And, and you, I know that you have gone into, you know, other underserved communities to help and talk to people and talk to the kids and, you know, and get them connected to architecture and other things. What do you say to them or to others who may be listening to this, who don't know where to start? They don't feel like they, they're not smart enough. They're not, they're not, they don't have enough money. They don't, everything for them feels like they're just not where they want to be. Where do they start in your mind? How do they get started? I think for anybody, um, it, if they've got to find somebody who cares, one person who cares about them, and that person, that person may not necessarily um, have all the tools or or have all the answers, but um, but I've I've just I've just I know that it just takes one person, you know, and, and, and that one person, if, if, if that child or that young person really um, is searching for something, I know that there's somebody within reach that, that, that cares about them. They can't quite figure out why, and they can't quite figure out, um, you know, they can't see through the things that they're going through personally. But I know that once a connection is made between two people, and you know, and you hear a lot about that, you know, with big brothers and big sisters, and you hear a lot about that with different mentoring programs. And the reason that those, if you can get to that person either through a formal program or just a connection, and you listen, um, you can go that 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 can be the spark in so many ways um, because it's not, I, I, you know, I hear time and time again, how, you know, somebody was, you know, in an audience and they heard somebody speak and they don't remember anything else, but there was a connection and something got said and something got heard. And then all of a sudden somebody believed in something that they never thought before or they saw something that they never saw before, right? And that could just be simply that they saw a female, a woman who is now head of a business or doing something that that's their color that they've never seen before, right? And you would be amazed at how many, how impactful that one thing can be for somebody who has been starved and has never seen anything like that before, all of a sudden they go, my, you know, I saw, I, I saw it, somebody else could do it. I mean, I don't know whether left to, on my own a kind of um, strength that if it weren't for my father that I would have been able to do. But most of the things that I recall from my father boiled down to things that I can tell you were not he wasn't in my ear. He wasn't saying things to me every day, but he would do something and I would see him do it. And I would, I would say to myself, I don't know how he did it, but he did it. And then it resonates, right? And then it's the same thing. If you, and, and so I, we try, I try to um, I now more than ever, just try to engage more for that reason, right? You know, um, People need to, to, to see the firm. They need to understand that, you know, we are a diverse form, firm. And maybe for some people trying to get an architecture, that's music to their ears because there's not a lot of the types of firms that we have out there. And um, that where the leadership, you know, um, I'm, as, a, as you know, I'm president. And, and so that's, and I'm a founder of the firm. And so they don't get to see that often. And so the structure, the culture of the firm is a good one. It's, it, it resonates with people. And, and so I think, um, and look, I, I, I really do wish, and I, I wrote this in the, in the article I was mentioned before, that I really do wish people had what I had, and which is just somebody that they can see, do something. Right, because when they see somebody do something, they're like, "Okay, I can do that too." Yeah, and those experiences, and um, those experiences, and those connections are so important. They're so important. 
you know, we, we have a lot more in common than I thought, because what it's when you just said one other person. So I have said this on the podcast so many times. It only takes one other person to believe in you more than you believe in yourself. And you, they will launch you. They will launch you because it's happened to me. And uh, it's, that's cool. it's happened. It's totally ha- it happened to me with the podcast. I didn't even know who was going to be guests and who <laughs> would resonate and all that. And then one person liked the interview, liked the way I interviewed. So they they said, you need to interview this person and that person. And it just went all around the world. And I was like, how did this happen? But it it does. It's all about connection. That to me is the most important thing. You just mentioned something. What am I? Uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to catch the the phrase correctly, but it just has to do with life is real strange um, in that, um, to your point, you don't really, when you try to figure out where you're going to be, it's really hard because um, it it almost becomes overpowering, right? If you really sit back and go, okay, well, I want to, one day I want to be, I, I can't see how I can be in this spot today and then be where I think I want to be later on based on this plan, right? And the reality and the great thing about life is once you take that first step and then all of a sudden life intervenes and people intervene, people that you could never have identified, people that you could never have known, but because you started, you know, sort of taking that first little step, all of a sudden people there are like, hey, I got you, you know, I can, you know, let me grab one hand, you know, let me, you know, let, let, oh, go over here. You, oh, you don't know so-and-so, go meet them. And then that person says, go meet the other person. And then that person, get, and then all of a sudden the structure starts to emerge around you in ways that you never could have imagined. But it all boils down to that first little, as you say, it's somebody saying that believed in you more than you would have believed in yourself and saying, hey, you, you know what? You should try this. You can do it. And then all of a sudden you go, well, boy, I don't know. And then all of a sudden, a ho- this, what you just described is what happens more often than not, which is doors open, connections are made, people come into your life that you never, ever knew, and on and on and on it goes. Oh, it's, it's so true. And it happens for anybody at any level, because whether you're CEO of an organization, you still have goals that you want to reach and may seem unattainable. How, how will we get to the, the company to the next level? But then you meet someone who says, well, I have a project or there's someone you need to meet who needs this or what the the connections go from the time you're a child all the way through your entire adult life. And I also think Vince too, what you were saying, the more you go out there and you talk to the kids or whoever it is that you go and speak to yourself and people listen to podcasts, whatever it is, that's what the change making is all about. Putting yourself out there to share the message. So now that you can help create change in the generations or those that are even in your generation that don't that don't think that they can do it, they can do it too. It doesn't matter what age you are. That first step happens at any age. At any age. Great stuff. It is. It is great stuff. So I want to um I just I want to ask you our last question that I ask yeah. everybody um on the podcast. And, and I'm curious, I'm excited to hear your answer on this one. What is the footprint that you're creating right now that you want to leave behind? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. Um, it, it's, as I said, it's, it's, it's born out of, it's born out of uh, what we're trying to do now, you know, with the firm. And, and we have a tremendous opportunity um, here at DI, DI Group Architecture um, because we, we're just, I'm just so proud of everyone here and, and the work that we're doing and, and a little bit of a, a pivot in the sense that we, we um, be, because as I pointed out with my father uh, in the past, you know, we, um, we just went about doing our work and, and, and in this firm and sort of the continuation of that legacy for me um, and what we have sort of culturally within the firm and the things that I talked about, about architecture and about people um, really is what we want to leave behind. That is really what we want to carry forth um, 
those are the people that we want in the firm. We want to reach as many people as we can through this firm doing the work that we do um, and kind of sing our song. And, and I think that's probably the best way to describe it. You know, we, uh, more so than ever, I'm trying to communicate with people about who I am, about um, what the firm is about, what the firm stands for. Uh, and, and I think it's important because uh, now is the time to kind of step up in, in our own way, um, to be recognized for the great work that we do as architects and, and how that work can really impact communities. And, and that's really what I think. It's time for us to sing our song, do our thing, um, be proud of it, um, get out there, let people know that we're out there, let people know about the firm and the great work that we do. I'm really going to throw a curveball at you, but I have yeah. to ask the question. Yeah. So you said sing your song twice. What would be the title of that song? <laughs> that's a great one. <laughs> Ooh, that's a, that is a curveball. Um, right? Yeah, that is a, that is a curveball. It, uh, it may be something to think about, but I've just like you said that twice. Like I always, I love to listen and, and, and I listen intently to every word that everybody always says. But that's in, it, you said it twice, so I'm like, there's something there. You know, part of I, you know, part of what um, makes me think about it, because there are, I think about artists, and I think about uh, so many fantastic artists, and 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 architecture obviously is is an art onto itself. The you know, kind of the the mother of all arts because it it embodies so many different things, and and I think that you know today, you know, you you just hear you just see so many different people and so many artists that um, you, you, it's great to see their work. And, and there are so many different ways to see it now and so many different platforms. And um, I, you know, I sort of, you know, you sing a song as a metaphor and obviously in the sense that, you know, um, there's, there's just so many cool things that we do on a daily basis that um, if we had the time, we would just, you know, kind of talk about them all the time, but we have work to do uh, as well. But, you know, but there's so many different stories within the stories of the work that we do every day. And, and it is, it truly is, you know, um, you know, I just try to think of that, um, that metaphor to, you know, when people are saying, hey, look, they need to hear what you're saying, they need to learn about the firm. And, uh, and, you know, in the past, I just, I just felt that it was just kind of, you know, just doing my thing and, you know, doing architecture and I'm happy, I, you know, whatever. And, but right. that's not always enough, right? Um, that's not always enough um, that there is uh, beyond the, you know, business reasons. There are so many other reasons why that's not just enough. And those are the reasons that you and I spent a little time talking about today. It's not enough just to do that. It's, I've learned that in some respects, it's a little selfish, right? Um, you know, in the sense that, you know, people, you know, um, pe all people, but certainly people of color, women, uh, people that recognize that there are a whole lot of people, there's a lot of people that need a lot of help and a little and some guidance in that first step. And hey, um, you know, that's a that's an opportunity. That's why I do what I do. That's why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and that exposure um, means a lot. Um, you know, beyond business, it means a lot to a lot of people. And, uh, and, and so I'm, I'm just, I'm grateful to be on your show and talking about the things that, you know, that matter, you know, matter to me. Yeah. So it's not just the title of the song, it's the entire song, right? Because if you don't sit and, and it is a little, it can feel a little selfish to share your story or to tell your, you know, or to sing your own song about what you're doing. But if it resonates, that's what I always said. If even one person helped one person with each episode, that it's been all worth every single moment that you know that I've had these interviews, and I think that's what's so important about. Um, and I love the metaphor. Um, so I'm sorry that I threw the curveball, but it's okay. <laughs> it, but I feel like that was something that it made it made a lot of sense to me because you're you're thinking of it as an art, and it and it is an art. Everything that we do, and and all that you're creating is is artwork. So it's, it's, it's just incredible. I also wanted to, to say, we kept talking about your dad, but we didn't, we didn't say his name. And I'd love to be able to say his name. Yeah, Harvey Myers. 
Awesome, awesome, thank you. Thank you for sharing about your dad and all the incredible work that you're doing. Where can people find information about DI? Well, we, um, uh, we're now doing a great job um, with uh, social media, so we can be found on LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, and so, uh, and our website, DI Group Architecture, of course, and, and anybody that wants to go there can then navigate to those other platforms for sure. Um, so digrouparchitecture.com. And, uh, you know, that's where you'll see, um, you know, a lot, a lot of our work, uh, uh, most of it, a lot of the finished work that we've done, uh, completed projects in all the areas that we, that I talked about. Wonderful. Vince, thank you for your time and for sharing your story with me today. Jody, it was great talking to you, uh, really. And uh, I, I, I'm going to be a fan of yours. I thought this was a great conversation. So congratulations on, and I'm so happy to meet you and we'll stay connected. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm going to say what I say at the end of every podcast. Again, thank you to Vincent Myers for being a guest today. And today, you cannot go back to yesterday and you do not yet own tomorrow. So what small or large step are you going to take today to get yourself closer to your goals? Have a great week, everyone. Bye, Vince. Bye, Jody.